Alright guys, I am going to be going into arrays now. So if you notice, I am just in my terminal and I'm going to do this part through the REPL because I believe this can show aspects of the array that would be kind of difficult to see if we we're just coding on a script. So first I'm going to talk about what an array is. So an array is a container that can hold objects of different types, depending on how you define it. Super abstract. Let's look at an example. So this is going to be an array. And you can see I use two bracket symbols. And I'm going to hit enter. And there we have it. So it's, in this case, the object is any. And if I want to add stuff to this array, I'm going to use push, which is another function. And then you can see I use this exclamation point. Now the exclamation point is a way Julia shows that a function is changing a, a variable, a variable of some sort. If you're using plots, you see the plot exclamation point. And it means this plot is being edited. If you see, in this case, you see the push exclamation point. It means this array is going to be altered and the output is going to be different from the input. So I'm giving the first variable, which is the container, and then I'm going to push one to this. Now you can see array has one element in there. Let's say I called it a couple more times. All right, and array now is a four element container, all just containing ones. Now, if I want to go through the container, if I call r1, now put that variable. Let's say I want to change one of them. r2 is equal to 2. I do that. Now, let's clear this so we can see better. And now I'm going to output the array. And you can see in the previous step, I changed one of the elements which now this one is two rather than one, but then everything else stayed one. Okay, so another thing is we notice the type is any. Now, right now I just have numbers in here, but I can also push a string. So push r hello. And now you can see we have one, two, one, one, hello. And if I do that fifth element, five, hello. Okay, so other things to look at here. If you notice, Julia indexes at one. If you're coming from other coding languages, in this case Python, Python indexes at zero, while Julia starts at one and goes to the size of the container. So it has five elements, so it'll go one to five. Another thing to notice is how the array is being shaped. You can see that all the elements are going in a column fashion. And that's something a bit deeper where how memory is allocated in Julia. But if you're aware of how memory works, Julia allocates memory in a column fashion rather than a row fashion. So also coming from a Python background, Python allocates memory in row order. Julia does it in column order. All right, now I'm going to talk about a different function called append. I'm going to make an array, and it's going to be empty again. Okay, there it is. And first, I'm going to push something. I'm going to push hello, just like last time. And you can see it does that. Now, append works similarly, but you're going to see how it's going to change up the output. I'm going to put world and OK, now you can see something totally different. OK, so what's happening here? We first pushed hello into the array. And what push does is it pushes this variable into this container. Now what append does is it appends this container with this container. 
So it thinks it's treating this as if it's one big container. So a string is a container of chars. And now it's going to append each of these variables in there. So now hello is going to be hello. And then world is going to be each new element. So you can see it went from one to six. So append, append can append containers, essentially. If I show with numbers, let's say one, two, three. Okay, now I want to append R with four, five, six. And you can see it extended it. Well, if I was trying to push this, this is going to give me an error. Okay, now if I wanted to push these values, I would push it as separate variables rather than one big container. And you can see here I did these brackets and encased it. Now I'm just going to push it like this, and then you're going to see these get appended to this array. Okay, and we got one, two, three, four, five, six, four, five, six. Cool. All right, now one final thing I want to show is typing for arrays. Now when I say typing, I mean the variable types. You can see when you define an array just like this, it says any. Well, let's say we want our array to be an explicit type. Now we're going to define array like this, and we're going to define the type we want. Now let's say we have an array of ints, and we want it to be right now undefined variables and we want it to be a vector. So this is one dimension. Now I'm going to do this, and you see it's going to be undefined like that. All right, now let's say we want to change that one output to 10, and it gets changed to this. And similar idea, we push x, and we're going to push one to it. And you see we're just appending values to it okay now in this case this is an explicit int array now if i wanted to push a string to this this is going to give me an error boom and you can see it says cannot convert an object type of string to an object of type int and so it's freaking out because you're giving a container that's ints, but you gave a string that you want to push to it, and it doesn't know what to do. And this also happens if you have an array of ints, in this case, and let's say we want to push a flow. And pretty much the same exact thing. In this case, you, you can convert a float to an int, but it's pointing out that if you do this, it's going to be inexact. The 3.2 is going to be changed and it's become 3. So it's, it's not letting you do this because it's, it's going to produce an error. Okay, now let's say I want to make an array of floats. Now I can't just write float, I have to write abstract float. Abstract float undefined 1. It's going to take a little bit longer. Okay, now now we get this hashtag undefined. Now we want to change that to 3.2. Okay, and let's see. I just output y. It's, it's all good. And same deal. You can do y1, and you see 1 is going to be cast as a float now. If we gave it an int, it can change ints to floats, and it'll be 1.0. If we put 5.2 and just keep on appending. Oh, not like that. Okay. So we have X and we have Y. And these are the two different types. And there is an over encasing. Let's say we want an array that both takes in ints and floats. So now if you give it an integer, it won't just cast it as a float all of a sudden. And this is. We'll call it z equals array array 
real and call it undefined again one okay now if i do z of one equals say 3.2 again cool and if i want to push on a variable z one you can see this time it didn't change one to a float like this did because this has to be in floats so it's going to recast this but real is able to take in floats and integers so it's going to take this float leave it this integer leave it and it will continue taking in other values i push z with 5.2 get this okay and there's there's an another larger type called number and that exists also because there's complex numbers so if you want an array that take in, takes in reals and complex numbers and they have other data types as well then they get more and more abstract all right one last thing i want to talk about is multi-dimensional arrays so let's define another array i'm going to call it a float 64 in this case and it'll be a three and two. Now you can see here we have a three by two array, so three rows, two columns, and this is in scientific notation, but these numbers are so small these are essentially zero. Now let's say I want to change one of them. This is going to change the one. Now if we look at x, it's one point zero. If I want to change this is oopsie equals three. And now if I output X again, changes that one. Okay. And then I also wanted to just show this so you can see how the memory set up. Other ways you can design arrays is we can design an array of zeros. So if you're this is from MATLAB, but also Python has something like this. Let's say we want a four by five array of zeros. You can see it created that. The same thing works if I want to make an array of ones and do a six by four. And you see it did that as well. And you can see how it's setting up the matrices. Now there are packages that interact with these. There's a linear algebra package which does the whole trace and transposes them and does the matrix multiplication. I'm not going into that right now. This is more showing how the memory is set up, how you access the arrays, and how you can change the elements. Next, I'll be going into loops and list comprehension and how those can be used with arrays along with everything else we've been learning.